Psalms 126, or if you have it on your phone, pull it up, Psalms 126, and then we're going to read Psalm 137, just a couple different scriptures, and I want to share with you something that is uh, life-changing, For, uh, Psalms 126 and Psalms 137, so go with me to Psalms 126, is where I want to read from for just a few minutes and share with you. I'm glad you're here today. It's good to see you. And I want to uh, give you just a few fishes and loaves. You ready? ready? Psalm 126, verse number 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Everybody say the word dream. dream. Now, when that happened, this was the result, verse 2. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for them. Go to verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth and weeping bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing sheaves with him. Now jump over to Psalms 137, <coughs> which is akin or related or comparable or paralleled to what you just read, and I'll explain it in a minute. Psalms 137 and verse number 1 says, By the rivers of Babylon, uh, there we sat down. Yes, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required us a mirth or a, a hymn saying, Hey, 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 sing us one of those church songs, you bunch of slaves. How will we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How are we going to do that? So I'm on, verse, I'm on number seven. So don't turn me up, turn me back down. Okay, and I'll fix your problem and I'll, I'll work this mic. If I have to eat it, I'll eat it, but I'll make it easy on you, okay? Uh, channel seven, leave it right there, baby. That's perfect. So these two chapters I just read to you, they're parallel. They work like a hand and a glove. Take the high out of that just a little bit, a little bit of high out. Psalms 126 and Psalms 137, they fit like hands on a glove. Now, let me explain that. When you look at Psalms 137, the, the fifth word is Babylon. That word, everybody say Babylon. Babylon. That word, that place, that geographical Hitler to some people. Now, I don't know if you've heard the term Holocaust but Holocaust was not the first time that the Jewish people were murdered or enslaved. If you remember, a guy named Pharaoh in Egypt held the Hebrew people as slaves for uh, nearly 400 years. The second round of slavery for the Jewish people was to a place called Babylon. Now, the idea of captivity is um, something that we're not really perhaps uh, used to. Some of you will go to weddings this week or socials or family gatherings. You're not sitting here going, what am I going to eat? You're sitting here thinking, where am I going to eat? So the idea of being uh, taken or having your children taken, not only taken but abducted and put into Babylon, furthermore executed while you sit and stare at the massive gates with the heads of lions at the uh, gates of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon staring back at you. So now that I've got you totally confused, let me clear the fog up. In 586 B.C., 500 years before Jesus, the Hebrew people were escorted and marched into uh, Iraq, Iraq and Syria, the Tigris-Euphrates River that runs like that. It's called the Fertile Crescent. Some people believe it's the actual place where the Garden of Eden was, it was even at one, uh, some, some view it that way. But the Fertile Crescent of, the, um, of Babylon, which we would come to know as Iraq and Syria. Now, let me clear this up for you. In Genesis 11, there is a man, his name is Nimrod. This is actually in your Bible. And he, his wife, um, she was known as the queen of heaven. 
And Nimrod built a city called Babel. B-A-B-E-L. Babel. And God came down in Genesis 11 and Genesis 10 and he decided that he would what? He would scatter that group because they said, we're going to build a tower, a ladder that reaches to heaven. And they were so unified yet in their destruction that God had to scatter them. And of course the name of that, that, that foundation would eventually, was called Babel or scattered and eventually would become uh, the contemporary Babylon. You've probably heard the name Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a vicious king that forded the prior kingdom, Assyria, and he formed the greatest empire on planet earth and he called it Babylon. So this massive group of people sat by the river Rivers of Babylon, there we sat, we wept, we, we remembered Zion or Jerusalem, put our harps on the willow trees. They made fun of us, they mocked us, they said, sing us a song. Now let me put this in 4K, high definition, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a giant fan and I'm going to clear out all the baby powder that's in this room because you're probably thinking I have no idea what you're talking about. Let me clear it up for you. The name or the word Babylon is the name not chosen by the devil but chosen by God to encapsulate or put in one gulp all which is present and evil in this world. Babylon, the name, the idea, the truth in the Bible is simply in high definition the system of the world, the uh, 17 or what is it, 18 or 19 works of the flesh, the um, fornication, adultery, uh, greed, envy, murder, malice, lying, cheating, um, blood thirsty approach. It is the world system. Now let me digress just one second and drop a piece of gold in your pocket real quick. 50 years ago they thought, man, if you, um, if, if you come to church and you laugh in church, you're going to get a whooping. Because church, you, 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 church is serious. You gonna get your fanny busted. You, it's, ch it's church. You, things working. God is holy and reverent. And so we quote things like this. You've heard this scripture. It says, um, "I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable and pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed." Formed of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we usually think that to not be conformed to this world means to make it look really good for Sunday school. But not being conformed to this world, look at Pastor Eric, simply means you don't think like they do. You don't walk in anxiety. You don't hate people over a little issue or a big issue for that matter. You don't, you don't, you're not, a, an old dog don't fight over every situation. You're not encaptured by the world's system. Babylon is the last day, last end time system that will consist not of those who are indifferent to Jesus, but those who deep in their heart absolutely despise the name of Jesus. Now, that's step one. Let's take step two. Babylon. Say the word Babylon. It is not only viewed as a Genesis 11 city that was scattered, but when God scattered it, it didn't go anywhere. It just disintegrated a little bit. Because in the end times, all through Revelation 14, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, there is an empire that emerges. It is the Babylonian empire. Now, just for the record, in October, if you want your mind blown, we're going to do that. We can do that. Not I, but the Holy Spirit. And I'll teach on some end times. But I'm going to throw this in there just a second. When Daniel, in captivity, had 
had a vision of this giant in his vision. He saw kingdoms that were coming. Did you know that 40 years ago, people believed that the modern uh, Catholic Church was the reformed Babylonian Empire? And they thought, man, this, this coming. Well, we didn't know that the rise of Islam would be what it was. We didn't know there would be a Gulf War. Help me preach, somebody. We didn't know there would be battle upon battle. We didn't know that towers would fall in New York City. And the signs of the times are pointing like the finger of God that the writing is on the wall. Now, I can show you in the Bible how those empires lay out, but I'm not going to do that today. Amen. So Babylon reappears. And when she reappears, listen, she reappears. Let me make it very simple. In an end time picture, you've got the sheep, you've got the goats, you've got darkness, you've got light, you've got heaven, you've got hell, you've got, you've got these two dichotomies. You've got God's side, you've got the enemy side. And so she's viewed as a city. Now, Babylon is in contrast or the opposite of the holy city. If you've read Revelation, you've read this, maybe not understanding it, but you read it. And I, John, looked up and I saw a, a, new, a new Jerusalem, a city, coming down from God out of heaven. The new Jerusalem. It was a city that was descending out of the heavens. You know why God has no grandchildren, stepchildren? children and no white children, black children, brown children, pale children, self-tan cream children, fat children, skinny children. You know why God don't have any of that? Because if heaven's walls come down, your church walls have to come down, your brain walls have to come down, God will bring a city. The retractable four corners of heaven will unlatch and heaven will descend from there to here and an entire new government, new world, new city system with a new king that will be formed with priest and government that you and I will be in a brand new place called heaven. The curse of Adam will be broken. The reign of the Messiah will begin. Pain, suffering, heartache, tears will be gone. Death and hell will be no more and eternity will begin. I'm glad I'm on the winning side. Anybody else? I'm going to punch my ticket before it's time. Can I get a witness? Babylon is the opposite of that city. Babylon is the place from hell. In fact, listen, I'm going to quote scripture so it makes it clear to you. Babylon, God said, wait, wait, who, who, who's he talking about? Bab, what do you mean Babylon? God said, hey, 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 Babylon. I see you down there, you pretty, you little red Corvette. I see you, Babylon, swooning the world, putting the world in division. I, I see you. Let me digress a second. I, honest to God, I think on Judgment Day, God's going to say, everybody leave the room unless you work for media. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and then if you work for media, y'all come on in here real close. I want to talk to y'all just a minute. I want AOL, CNN, even them conservative idiots you listen to are milking you because it ain't about getting a new president. It's about getting ratings and they'll find anything good, bad, or bad good on anybody you put in office. It's all about the money. Did he just say conservative idiots? It's true, isn't it? There's liberal crazies and there's conservative crazies. They're all in for the money. Listen to what God said about Babylon. Let me explain it. Babylon is the big shiny bus everybody's on. And a church built around social issue is a church that will blow in and blow out. But a church that's built around the truth of God's word will know how to survive and thrive in any element and any environment. The church isn't off the clock. Can I preach a few minutes today? I feel good about myself. I ate my Wheaties this morning. Babylon is, is, is not Jerusalem. She's the city we're living in. Listen, let me, let me, I, it, it is so important for me to just stop and kind of squeal these brakes and kind of make you stretch your seatbelt out a little bit. And Are, are you okay there? You, you. Babylon is the headquarters 
of the false prophet, the Antichrist, and the dragon, who is Satan himself. I'll explain all that in October. The false prophet will work wonders like as in the Holy Spirit, the antithesis. The Antichrist is exactly who he says he is. He's Antichrist. And the red dragon is Satan himself. Does that make sense? Where you have a holy trinity, you have an unholy trinity. Still with me? Well, just like God the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, three in the Bible is the number of covenant. Five is grace. Six is man. Seven is God or rest or Sabbath. Eight is new beginnings. Twelve is government. Eight is new things. and Forty is testing. Numbers mean something. So three in the Bible is the number of covenant. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Has God still kept that covenant? There would be no Jesus if there were no Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Joseph, and on down the line you have Jesus, Mary. Does that make sense? Watch, watch, watch. Three is the number of covenant. Father, mother, child. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. God is a God of covenant. God will keep His promises no matter what. Amen. Watch. So there's an unholy trinity known as the false prophet and a Christ and the dragon. Guess where their city is? Their city has been given into a lease. The devil rules the airwaves and he's got it in a lease program. The devil is renting this world until renovation day. And Jesus will descend from heaven and step on the clouds. And the Bible says, listen, the Bible said the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Come on, say amen. Where is this holy, unholy city Babylon? Well... It's right here. And if you've read anything about the Bible, I, I will, I'll take you a little bit further down this road before we do a donut and come back. Here it is. Did you know that Revelation calls Babylon mystery? Babylon? Did you, do you know why? That God called the ancient dark city, the world system Babylon, when you see it burned to the ground, Revelation 19, 20, 21, when John looks and he sees a city and the smoke that ascended from that city was unlike anything he had ever seen. It was a modern day Sodom as the smoke rose to the heavens. He looked and the angel said, Alas, alas, Babylon is burning to the ground. There was a celebration. Do, look at me. Do you know why God said, Oh, do you mean mystery Babylon? You know why God calls Babylon a mystery? Look at Pastor Gamble. This will blow your mind. You know why? Because why would a mother put her kids in a car and drive them into a river? They can, psychologists can't figure it out why would a person take a child stab them and cut them in pieces why would a man rape a woman why would a woman sell her children why would all Why we can't figure it out and the greatest therapy money can buy can't either because God said it's so vile it's a mystery you can't even put your right now did you know the attention span used to be 22 seconds then it went to 12 now it's at 8 now it's at oh it's gone Because it's so mysterious how fast the world spins something. I, I, I know a guy and he got in some trouble. And I said, hey man, don't worry about it. Tomorrow they'll forget about you. And they'll move on to something else they can kill and destroy. Because it happens so fast. Are you with me today? Now, quickly. If you don't think Babylon is alive and well, you'd be sorely mistaken. Well, happy Palm Sunday, y'all. Wait, wait, tell me your palm. Come on. Now turn it around. Look at your hand. Happy Palm Sunday. Now look at Pastor Eric. Number one, I'm going to give you reasons using your palm that we're in Babylon. Number, reason number one, COVID is real, but COVID has been used as a dress rehearsal for what is coming. Let's test them and let's put it in layers and let's see how far we can take it. COVID is used as a dress rehearsal for what is coming one day on this earth. Come on. 
Number two, if you think the new world order is on its way, you're wrong. The new world order is already here. Say amen. Number three, the church is officially like underwear for people. If they don't like it, they change churches and move on. But the church is not built to have a one night stand. Get in the boat called the church and stay in it because when Babylon opens her gates, you're going to need to be on a rock that Jesus is on. Don't jump off the ship. Stay on it until we land on shore. Brock Chisholm, the head of the UN in New York, the head of the World Health Relations, he said there are four things that we must do to change the world. He said, number one, take people's individualism from them. I think every God-born man and woman ought to have the right to think for themselves. Number two, destroy their religion. Number three, destroy their patriotism. And number four, destroy their loyalty to their family. If you do those four things, you can destroy a nation. Come on, y'all. That's why why I'm going to always defend men. And I don't even care if the husband's a little grumpy. If you got a man in your house that's pushing the plow, that loves God just a little old bit, you got a gold check in this day and time. Because men are popping a baby out and move on to the next shack. Men have got to stand up for what's right or we lose this country. (laughs) Pastor Eric, you know you're on live stream. Change the channel. We got to have some men. (laughs) Say amen, y'all. They are in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, Y'all sing us one of them church songs, y'all know, you bunch of slaves. You think your mind's blown now. Wait, I was studying all this yesterday. This has been in me for a couple months. I bet you can't tell. (laughs) I read a rabbi who said, he said, I I don't even want to tell you all this. He said, but Nebuchadnezzar, the mighty king of Babylon, was a midget. what I did he was a dwarf he was a 586 BC Hitler and he was four feet tall because the devil don't need a lot of space he just needs a room he'll take your mind that's fine just your tongue I just need your mouth Hitler killed 6 million Jews. Nebuchadnezzar slaughtered 80,000 because they wouldn't sing a song. And inside of that horror, the writer says these words. And again, listen, this is where the, the plane ride gets turbulent. This is where you get your peanuts right here. When the Lord turned again... Our captivity, we were like them that dream. It's God born, it's God bred, and it's Holy Ghost fed within the human heart to think beyond where you are. Look at Pastor Eric. You are born to dream no matter if you're sitting by the rivers of captivity. Let me say it again. You are built to see beyond you no matter what your environment is. Let me prove it. Let me prove it. If I walk out of this building today and I kind of walk in this pace like this, kind of a scurry as they say in the south, And I go outside and I open that front door and I go 25 yards out into this parking lot and I go. I got a clean $100 bill that says somebody's going to walk up beside me and say, Hey, whoa, whoa, what are we looking at? Because not only are we drawn to attention, but we're drawn to release attention. If you don't believe it, people that pass a wreck where people are stepping from here to eternity, they're dying in a, in a 
a horrific car accident. And you know what we're doing? We're driving feeling like we have the neck of an owl. We're so crazy, we won't even think about the people. We'll say, man, look at that car. Because people are drawn to tragedy. Help me preach somebody. We're drawn. Imagine if we were drawn to victory like we're drawn to drama. Imagine if we were attracted to joy like we're attracted to a trial. But we're attracted to a tragedy. And he said, by the rivers of Babylon we wept. But when the Lord turned our captivity, listen, we were like them that dreamed. We were like them that dreamed. The writer says, I sat there by that river with my family. And I said, God, am I going to die here? And all of a sudden I heard the Lord say, I'm going to turn this captivity and it's going to be like a dream. Have God ever told you something that was too good to be true and yet you know God said it? We were like them that dreamed. This is my favorite point of this message right here. I've broken this down into three categories. Of why people die. Diet, drugs, and dreamlessness. What they're eating. What they're popping. And a lack of dreams. Does anybody remember 20 years ago when you were in school or wherever you were and somebody, you had to sit down and somebody said, We're going to start out the discussion like this. Where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in ten years? Come on, help me, y'all. And you said, oh, I see myself owning a business. They didn't tell you the first two was going to crash. Because you got to learn before you lead. I'm preaching good whether you shouting or not. They didn't tell you you're going to lose a tooth and they go, you're going to get your head busted by life before you learn how to be the doctor, nurse, and the dentist. And so the dream is free. The process will cost you. But there's two types of pain in life. Two types of pain. The pain you pay before or the pain you pay after. There's two schools in life, consequence or discipline. The school of discipline says, man, I need to lose weight. I'm going to get up and walk in the morning. And you pay that tuition before. If you don't go to the school of wisdom and discipline, you go to the school of consequence. Here's a hint. School colors are black and blue. And usually the tuition that you pay after has 100% interest charge. Come on, y'all. And you pay. usually it costs you several years to pay off. Lindsay, am I doing okay today? Okay, thank you. Diet, drugs, and no dreams. So... Where will you be in 10 years? Here's your best answer. You don't know. (laughs) You know, I'm not not a control freak. I know people that are. Please don't look around. Um, (laughs) I'm up here. I can see you. (laughs) I, I know people that are control freaks. And would you believe that I think the hardest thing for a control freak to come to terms with is the reality that you are actually not in control whatsoever. That literally today, they could just drop on your house and your whole life change. You, you, literally, you are not in control of anything. With the exception of you putting one foot in front of the other. This is so foreign to most people, they can't even get it in their heart. We quit dreaming a long time ago. We did. I can promise you this, I'm not. I'm not stopped dreaming. I'm such a dreamer. You know what I do? I put on my refrigerator the goals that me and Jesus were meeting. I had a little credit card debt. It's not debt compared to some of y'all's. 
but I had a couple little grand on a credit card. We, we stacked up the different Christmases. I said, God, help me pay. So I put it on my refrigerator. You know why? Because if you can see the goal, you can do the goal. Out of sight, out of mind, you put it in a cubicle or the hallway of your heart, you ain't ever going to do it. But if you'll set it in front of you, force yourself to do it. I've got a friend. He said, I'm so fat I can't tie my shoes. So he put a man in his underwear, one of these muscle guys in their underwear, on his refrigerator. And he said, that, he said by Christmas time, I'm going to look like that guy right there. While he was eating a Big Mac... You mark it now, I'm going to look just like that guy. And he said every day that he gets up, he goes and he stares at the guy. His wife loves the picture. Come on, y'all. He he's despises it because he, here's where he is, here's where he wants to be. Now they'll sell it to you at 3 8, 8 a.m. in the morning for four easy payments of twelve ninety nine. You, too, can get an ab roller that will give you abs that look like an old-timey washboard. And six months later, the ab roller is in your neighbor's yard sale because you bought it but the pain of the process kicked you out see there's pain on both sides one pain watch one of those pains brings benefit and blesses your life the other pain has a side effect called regret in reality you are supposed to die empty So, Psalm 126 and verse 2. Ooh, this got me. When the Lord turned our captivity, we were like them that say dream. Everybody say dream. dream. Listen. To the side effects of them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. When you start dreaming, your mouth will start dreaming. When you start dreaming, listen, you get your testimony back. Hold on. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. (laughs) When you start dreaming with God, you get your testimony back. You start talking different. You'll even start laughing more. One of my, um, I used to love to listen to Lester Sumrall. Y'all know who Lester Sumrall is? Man, I, I still listen to Lester Sumrall. He had a woman come into his office and she said, I've been to the Mayo Clinic 13 times. He laughed at her. She said, you've offended me. You're my pastor and you're laughing at me. He said, ma'am, if you've been to the Mayo Clinic 13 times and they've told you there's nothing wrong with you, there's nothing wrong with you. She said, I'm not happy. He said, bow your head. He said, I'm going to give you a prescription. He said, look at me. He said, you vow to me you'll do this every day. Do you promise me? Yes, sir. Uh, do you promise? Yes, sir. I pro- do you promise? You pro- every day you, you, you take this pill. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He said, you get up every day and you go into your bathroom and you look in the mirror and you quote this proverb. And he gave her the reference. He says, laughter is like good medicine. It, it, it loosens up the soil of the soul. I added that last part. That's Clark translation, chapter 3, verse 15. <laughs> laughter, God says, is like unto a medicinal, like a oil, like a 
therapy. You know why some of you can't laugh as much as your spirit wants to? Because you're so busy trying to figure out politics, you don't even have room for joy. You're so busy trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow, and tomorrow may not even come. But God wants to give you your joy back, and when you get your joy back, you get your dream back, you start laughing more, you start singing more, you start being likable and liking people you really don't like, but you like them because God likes them. He said, you quote that every day for 40 days. A week later, her husband showed up at his door in Indiana, beating on the back door of the church. Pastor Sumrall, he answered the door. He said, I got a bone to pick with you. He said, what's the problem? He said, what did you do to my wife? He said, I didn't do anything to her. He said, yes, you did. He said, every day she gets up, she looks in the mirror, and she says, God loves me, and laughter is as a medicine. And she goes, ha, 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 ha. He said, what did you do to my wife? He said, sir, I didn't do anything to your wife. He said, your wife did something to your wife. She read the Bible to herself and it set her free. She had the key in her pocket to her own chain and she set herself free when she began to take the medicine of the Bible. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with singing. (laughs) I can promise you that I'll do my best with this next thought I'll do my best you have my word nowadays we would prefer you not laugh in church I'm preaching now and by all means don't sing Look at me. If for some reason, God forbid, I have to leave this world, roll me in here on a cot with wheels, come on y'all, and give Jean Wright the microphone and just let her sing. Because if I'm in trouble... I don't need this. I'm just an old chunk of coal. I need the next part. But I'm going to be a diamond someday. If I'm going through it, I need somebody to sing a song. Pastor Eric, this is so simple. It's science. Is science. Trust me, it works. <laughs> y'all, y'all remember that song a couple years ago? <clears throat> I feel so happy, clap along if you feel like a room without. Remember that song? If poor Pharrell, if he never sings another song, oh, come on, y'all. I'm fine with that. Y'all okay with that? I'm cool with that. But he will live off the royalties of simply making one three-minute goofy song that taps everybody's toes or drives you crazy or taps your fingers, snap you. That's it. Now you don't need to laugh in church. Babylon. Come on, y'all. Now you don't need to sing in church Babylon. But here's the good news. Today if you want to be a pedophile, a murderer, get high, sell some kids or abort them. If you'd like to be bisexual, heterosexual. I'm heterosexual by the way. I'm a proud heterosexual. 
I want to give a big shout out to the heterosexual community in my life. Sleeping with the same wife I married. Come on, somebody. I like this marriage thing. It works out better. Hey, I'm working on one woman. I can't handle three. Give me an amen right there. I ain't into polygamy, maligamy, or whatever it is. I'm going to stick with this one. You can be homosexual. God love you. I love you. We love you. They love you. God loves you. You can make it. We can make it. Let's stay in it together. Asexual, no sexual, rape. But bless God, you better not sing or laugh. You know why you don't need to sing and laugh? Because when you sing and laugh about the goodness of God, you break up something on the inside of you that the devil can no longer hold against you. When you start singing, oh God, great is your name, God, you've been so good to me. When you start whistling like that, when you start hmm like that, when you start getting jiggy with it like that, you break up ground in your life that the devil says, I can't hold them if they won't hold them. And you'll set your own self free. We were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with singing, our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue filled with singing. <laughs> um, everybody look at Pastor Eric. Look at me, look at me. I'm wrapping it up. No charge. You're welcome. Filet mignon in Babylon is baloney. But they lure you in with some, some sirloin. Come on. But then what you realize is they're really not after the loyalty to your family. Come on. They're after your soul. The idea of God rescuing these slaves was too good to be true. Yet it was so true, Caleb, that it shocked them. <laughs> we're not shocked when the devil messes stuff up, but we're shocked when God blesses us. There ain't nobody shocked when the devil throws a wrench in the fan. But you let God calm our troubled waters down and we're, oh, well, my God didn't think that was going to happen. I want to, um, tell you something that was on my heart yesterday. It's just a, it's one thought. Relax. Now that <clears throat> that baby's saying hallelujah. Amen. Now that I'm going to offend three people right now. Now that the racism conversations quieted down just a little. Now it's time to actually discuss it. But nobody actually wants to deal with it unless it's a hot topic. But somebody died today in this country of every skin color. You just didn't hear about it. I'm no equally less angry if it was unjustified. Are you? But 2,000 years ago, and this is just my style. I like to wait till the smoke clears to light a candle of truth. It's easy to hold this microphone and tell you what I believe. And it's easy for you to tell me what you believe. Hold on, hold on. It's a little bit different though when we get in the streets with it. And it's an actuality. That's when it becomes real now all of my four children are mine as far as I know 
And, and it's my first God-given privilege to take care of my family. That doesn't mean it doesn't get heavy. Or that my children or your children, hold on, I'm going to help you, will always do what you think they ought to do. But praise God, hold on, let the, let this, let the dust settle, digest it, digest it. At least you've got a family that loves at some level, and if you're able to see your kids at any point, you're still blessed beyond comprehension. Don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. Even if they're different. Some of you got gay kids. Let me help you. Love them, love them, love them, love them, love them, and then love them some more. You won't ever reach them hating them. Love them. I love my kids. And it's amazing how if I say, y'all come here, daddy's giving y'all some money. They'll swim the English channel to get to my room. But if I say, hey, I need some help. Do they live here? How many ever felt that way as a parent? <laughs> Where are they? They turn into ghosts. But I refuse to let my family live in Babylon. I took Jude to Beaufort. I love Beaufort. Beaufort by the sea. Took him out there because he wanted to do his Michael Jackson thing. You know, he wanted to do it out for the people. Billy Jean, he wanted to do his Michael Jackson. Took him out there. I sat there, and the dad part of me was going, Oh, Lord, how long is this going to take? It's raining. He wanted, he wanted to do it in the rain. I said, Jude, it's raining. I don't care. I just want to do it, Daddy. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. I said, All right, let's go. Let's go. I took, a, I took an offering bucket, one of these big old whiskey barrels, because we got big faith over here. Cling, 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 drop it. And, uh, and so I took him out there. Man, he ain't, he's making a little money. I thought, Well, praise God. I can charge him rent. <laughs> he's making some money. They're dropping his bucket. Guy comes by, drops him a $50 bill. I went over there, I stared down in the bucket. I said, keep dancing, son. Daddy's going to be right over here at this table. I'm going to go sit over now. I'm going to sit my old self down and shut my mouth and let that boy dream if he wants to. Hey, don't, don't, if you awaken a dream inside of you, your mouth will be filled with a new song. Laughter will roll out of you. It was so true it shocked them. So I want to read this to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, say that word whosoever. There's your race issue right there. Who can be saved? Who matters more than who? Nobody matters more than who. Hey, somebody said the Gentile church, God dismissed the Jewish people and grafted the Gentiles. And now the Gentiles take the place of Israel. That's not true because May of 1948, Israel was reestablished as a nation that was on God's calendar. God has not forsaken the Jewish people. You and I are not seed of Abraham. But when Jesus died, we became children of Abraham. I Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. And that's how we have firstborn rights into the kingdom of God. I'm not going to Babylon and buying land. I'm going to stay where I am. Babylon wants your heart. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Bow your heads with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I know there's people here, Lord, that They come to this church to get out of the hell of Monday to Saturday. Some people, God, come to the creative church to simply rest, R-E-S-T. They want to they be clothed with that peace that is in this church house because of prayer warriors that have prayed for years on this property. 
And they want to just Sabbath. They want to just come in here and shalom a little bit. Woo. Jane, bring that up just a little bit, and then I want you to come up here with Daddy. Glory. But God, there's people sitting here right now that need to dream again. One thing I there's two groups I want to talk to quickly. Number one, if you need to make something right with the Lord, simply slip your hand up and put it back down. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Second group, Pastor Eric, I feel like this message was sent from me. Slip your hand up. Come on. You want to dream again? I do too. You have not because you ask not. Stand with me. Let's take five minutes, gather in this altar and lift our hands. Come on and get our dream back today. Pastor Eric, it doesn't matter what color I am. It doesn't matter what color you are or what you did yesterday or 20 years ago. Come on. Let's get our dream back. Come on, join me in this altar. Let there be no strangers. Let there be no aliens. Let, th let there be no orphan spirit in this room. Come on, let's gather around in this altar. Let's lift our hands and let's say, God, help me to dream again. Maybe you're sitting by the rivers of Babylon today. Maybe the devil has told you it's a done deal. Your ship has sailed and your party's over. Whew. He's a liar.